<laughs> this video was made possible with the help and generous support of my patrons. If you would like to join them in helping grow this channel, you can do so at the links in the description below. This is a chart from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that's measuring two different trends. The orange line represents productivity or total value of goods and services produced by U.S. industry, while the red line over here represents worker compensation or the total value of wages received by workers in those industries. The purpose of showing these two trends side by side is to take note of the relationship between them. We can see that from 1945 to approximately 1970, the growth between total value output and wages remained constant. As workers produced more value output, they received a proportionate increase in compensation. However, we can also see at the beginning of the 1970s, this trend came to a gradual halt as wages began to stagnate. This trend continued for 50 years, and today, in 2023, wages remain at the levels they were at in the 1970s. But on the other hand, as the total value output of the productive sector continued to increase, stagnating wages spelled higher profits for corporations. Today, through rapid inflation, poorly paid jobs, and precarious contract labor, much of the working class is discovering that their wages are insufficient to purchase the things that previous generations were easily able to afford. In 2023, the inflated price of groceries, housing, and energy continue to hollow out the middle class and generate waves of anger and dismay among working people. Talking heads continue to point to this or that individual phenomenon as the cause of the crisis. COVID, banking deregulation, the war in Ukraine, anything China does, and so on. But to grasp the historic roots of the current crisis, it is crucial to understand what this chart is saying, where we were, where we are now, and how we got here. Certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. A second bill of rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Well, the world's 10 wealthiest men doubled their fortunes during the first two years of the pandemic as poverty and inequality soared. The early 20th century was a turbulent period in the history of the capitalist mode of production. As capital accumulation continued to expand, it eventually grew beyond the confines of the nation. Capital had become global, and the antagonistic relations it gives rise to also became global. This fact was not only realized in World War I, but also with the Great Depression beginning in 1929. Both of these crises, only one decade apart, each emerged at the global level as an expression of underlying economic processes that continued to push outward. The Great Depression came as a sudden shock, wreaking incalculable destruction on the lives of working-class people. From 1929 to the peak of the Depression, global GDP dropped by 15%, international trade fell by 50%, and unemployment reached up to 30% in Western countries. The US, where the Great Depression was sparked, rural farming communities were hit the hardest. The price of crops dropped so dramatically that roughly 10% of rural farmers could no longer pay their debts and were forced to sell their land. It took roughly a decade before the rural crisis was resolved and the agricultural sector was restructured. The economic orthodoxy during the time of the Great Depression was based on laissez-faire or let-be theory. The Austrian School of Economics, who spearheaded this theory, had always argued that capitalism did not produce general economic crises, but only isolated temporary downturns in particular industries. They argued that if governments let the market be, economic activity would eventually re-stimulate an equilibrium between supply and demand. From here, they argued that any form of state intervention to artificially generate recovery would only further disrupt the market and prolong the crisis. The recommendation of the Austrian school to let the market be, in practice, translated to doing nothing and letting the suffering of the working class play out. Western governments were generally dissatisfied with the Austrian school's diagnosis and solution to the crisis, 
Millions of unemployed people were piling into soup kitchens, homelessness flooded the countryside, industries couldn't sell their products, and in the background of all of this, the Soviet Union was urging workers of the world to overthrow their governments and implement a socialist worker state. The Soviets were calling on the international proletariat to follow their lead in transcending the capitalist mode of production and building a future world that did not depend on the madness of capital accumulation, perpetual economic crises, or the barbarism of exploitation. The Soviet Union faced many difficulties, and it was not immune from the consequences of the Great Depression. However, the Soviets successfully overcame many challenges that crippled Western capitalist societies. For example, as unemployment reached up to 30% in the West, the USSR maintained an employment rate of virtually 100%. Unlike the Austrian School of Economics, which never took Marxism or Soviet Communism as a serious alternative to capitalism, other segments of the bourgeoisie certainly perceived it as a threat. What would happen, they wondered, if millions of unemployed Western workers began to occupy their spare time learning about the 100% employment rate under Soviet Communism? Two individuals within the bourgeois class that diligently worked to prevent this from happening were the U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the British economist John Maynard Keynes. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, was elected U.S. President in 1932 on the promise of offering a new deal to the American working class. American socialist and communist parties were already growing and the economic crisis was pushing greater numbers into their ranks. FDR understood that without some type of economic relief, the working class would continue to be attracted to the socialist alternative. Therefore, in order to save capitalism, FDR needed to present it to the working class as the superior alternative to socialism. FDR was largely inspired by the British economist John Maynard Keynes, who, like FDR, was a capitalist that wanted to save capitalism from itself. Keynes opposed the laissez-faire approach of his Austrian colleagues who took a supply-side approach to economic questions by arguing their position from the perspective of sellers, or capitalists. Keynes, however, advocated for a mode of economic governance that held greater concern for the purchasing power of workers as a means of keeping the cycle of production and consumption in motion. Keynes understood the necessity of supply-side economics, but also pointed out the dependency that supply has on demand. He argued that without a growing demand for consumer goods, supply would eventually seize up and the economy would re-enter a crisis. Keynes's theory was significant because it was an expression of the bourgeois class coming to terms with the fact that capitalism had created a general crisis, a crisis of a magnitude that required a dramatic restructuring of the economy. FDR applied Keynes's ideas and similar ideas into policies that were highly favorable to the working class. In 1933, a series of laws were passed by Congress and a number of executive orders signed by FDR to institute the New Deal, a sweeping set of programs and agencies to facilitate relief, recovery, and reform. The New Deal immediately introduced a number of reforms that directly improved the economic condition of the working class. Unemployment insurance, payments, and benefits were widely distributed to millions of jobless workers, and in 1935, the Social Security Administration further expanded similar benefits related to old age retirement, disability, and maternity leave. The New Deal also introduced a number of large public programs that put millions of Americans to work in building a sturdy economic foundation to avoid future crises. The Civilian Conservation Corps was introduced as a federal agency that took on the responsibility of planning the conservation and development of federal land and resources. These were jobs that were provided to unemployed, unmarried men, as well as 15,000 Indigenous people employed to aid in the conservation strategies. The agency reached its peak with an enrollment of 300,000 workers. The Works Progress Administration introduced sweeping infrastructure projects which employed millions of workers who laid hundreds of thousands of kilometers of road, built over 10,000 bridges, many airports, and much housing. It had a budget of $4.9 billion, which accounted for a substantial 6.7% of US GDP in 1935. The Works Progress Administration also introduced the Federal Project Number no. 1, which established a series of cultural programs ranging from the Federal Art Project, Federal Music Project, Federal Theatre Project, Federal Writers Project, and the Historical Records Survey. 
The overriding purpose of the New Deal was to provide employment and income to millions of unemployed and unskilled workers. The jobs provided by these new agencies did not always pay well, but the wages were sufficient to stimulate an overall economic recovery among the US workforce. However, for the working class, these agencies represented much more than mere job programs. The infrastructure projects introduced by the Works Progress Administration built much of the foundation that helped elevate the standard of living of the US workforce. Housing was filled with low-income workers, highways were laid for the emerging automobile industry, and large energy projects would fuel the rising standard of US living. Furthermore, Federal Project No. 1 even demonstrated an effort to democratize cultural products by building capacity for theater, art, and musical productions among the working class. The New Deal reforms also took aim at restructuring labor rights and the overall meaning of U.S. citizenship, not only by expanding the rights of ethnic minorities, including indigenous peoples, albeit marginally, but also by guaranteeing an expanded domain of rights to the working class in general. In 1935, the FDR administration introduced policies that greatly strengthened the power of labor unions to negotiate a fair agreement with their employers. The Congress of Industrial Organization CIO, was introduced as a means of organizing and mobilizing labor under the purview of the state. Shortly after its establishment, the largest labor action in American history was sparked in Flint, Michigan, where auto workers demonstrated by laying down their tools in a sit-down strike. This strike quickly spread to other auto plants, and eventually 100,000 workers were picketing their plants across the country. As the situation escalated, workers became involved in violent clashes with police, with 14 injured. The vice president, John Vance Garner, supported the idea of bringing in federal troops to break up the strike, but FDR rejected his proposal and instead urged capitalists in the auto industry to recognize the legitimacy of the United Auto Workers Union. With this support from FDR, the strike was a great success and the United Auto Workers registered over 100,000 members to their union in the aftermath. The widespread establishment of labor unions was a tremendous advancement in the power of industrial workers to negotiate collective bargaining agreements and raise issues with their employers, including safety, wages, time off, and other newly established worker rights. FDR's vision for the future of the US even went beyond what he was able to achieve with his New Deal. During World War II, the U.S. had become so extraordinarily wealthy that FDR, along with many others, believed that the progress and status of the U.S. worker would only continue to rise in the years and decades to come. By the early 1940s, he even went so far as to publicly propose the idea of a second Bill of Rights. Certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. A second Bill of Rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. This was a bold set of guarantees that would greatly enhance the material condition of the working class. However, in order to pay for these reforms, which placed a heavy strain on the budget of the bourgeois state, FDR introduced a heavy tax on corporations which reached as high as 94% for the largest income earners. Unsurprisingly, there were many within the bourgeois class who despised FDR 
In fact, shortly after FDR's election, a small number of industrialists and financiers from large enterprises such as DuPont and Chase Manhattan Bank even plotted a fascist coup to have him overthrown and replaced by a military general. This coup d'etat never materialized, but ruling class efforts to reverse FDR's expansive reforms would continue to persist for decades to come. Unlike the developed industrial economies of Europe and Japan, the US had entirely avoided the destruction of World War II being brought onto its own soil. Throughout the war, as Europe destroyed its industrial capacity, American productivity only continued to grow, and by the end of the war, it not only had all of its industry intact, but was by far the most prosperous nation in the world. This unique set of circumstances provided the historic opportunity for the US to step forward as the global hegemon, at least over the capitalist West. World War II erupted as a conflict between imperialist powers such as the US, Great Britain, Nazi Germany, and Japan seeking to broaden their influence over the colonial world. In order to prevent such conflict from reoccurring between major capitalist powers, the US saw it necessary to exercise unilateral hegemonic control over global economic affairs. It enforced this hegemony through U.S. proxy institutions that were established at the global level in 1948, such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which later became the World Trade Organization. These institutions were introduced under a set of global rules and regulations known as the Bretton Woods Monetary System. The system was planned and implemented through the Bretton Woods Conference, which brought delegates together from across the world to sign on to the agreement. Everyone generally recognized the gravity of the agreement in handing over near total control to the US in planning of the world economy. John Maynard Keynes was the British delegate to the negotiations and underwent severe stress in guaranteeing Britain a secure position in the future global order no longer under its control. Meanwhile, Soviet delegates also felt extreme pressure coming from the US. 27 million Soviets died in World War II. It single-handedly defeated the Nazi attack on the Eastern Front and secured all of Eastern Europe under its control. But despite all of this, the Bretton Woods system treated the Soviets no different from Germany or Japan. The Soviet government refused to sign on to the agreement to participate in the system and condemned the conference that organized it as a branch of Wall Street. This marked, in many ways, the end of the World War II alliance and the beginning of the Cold War. The global reforms introduced by the Bretton Woods monetary system had the effect of restructuring circuits of capital within the Western world, particularly between Europe and the US. The American ruling class understood that without an export market for the large magnitude of commodities it was now producing, it would quickly face the problem of overproduction, underconsumption, and eventually fall back into a crisis. Therefore, the European Economic Recovery Plan, or the Marshall Plan, provided much of Western Europe, including the former German and Japanese enemies, tens of billions of dollars in low-interest loans to rebuild their infrastructure. In doing so, the US not only elevated itself to the status of a creditor nation, putting itself in a position of guiding the industrial development of Europe, but also established an export market to consume American goods. In the 10 years following the New Deal, the US GDP on average grew a staggering 12.5% every year, beginning at $67 billion in 1934 and reaching $224 billion in 1944. The wealth generated by US unipolar hegemony would continue to fund the domestic New Deal reforms that provided the US working class a growing standard of living. The car you wanted is really here. It's delightful. It's too lovely. It's too soto. You'll understand the reasons why. For once you drive it, you want to buy. It's delightful. It's too lovely. It's too As the wealth of the working class grew, so too did its desire for home ownership. The New Deal had provided some relief to homeowners in the 1930s, but it was World War II that truly enriched the working class and sharply raised its standard of living. If we return to the graph we started with, we can see that from 1945 to 1970, the US working class standard of living continued to climb and correlated with the general growth of total wealth. In other words, as the working class contributed to the growing wealth of society, they were rewarded for their contributions with a proportionate increase in the share of total wealth.
This post-war economic boom is what historians sometimes refer to as the golden age of capitalism and is the historic context under which the concept of the American dream is born. The American dream is central to the role of securing the hegemony of the capitalist system and its legitimacy in the eyes of the working class. It not only represented the idea that material comfort was achievable through hard work and discipline, but furthermore, that the capitalist free market system was what ultimately provided the opportunity for upward mobility. Workers, if they just continued to work hard, could achieve the American dream themselves, a home, a family, a vehicle, a white picket fence, and so on. In 1955, the median annual family income was $4,400, and the median cost of a house was approximately $9,000, and roughly 60% of U.S. households own their home. By 1965, the median annual family income was $7,000, the median cost of a house was $21,000, and roughly 65% of U.S. households own their own home. In other words, in 1955, the cost of a home was generally equivalent to a two-year salary. In 1965, it was equivalent to a three-year salary. Today, in 2023, the average cost of a house is anywhere from between five to six years worth of median income. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, home ownership increased in both absolute and relative terms by the tens of millions. The economic landscape of the golden age of capitalism was the basis of a new social contract between the state and citizens. Capitalism would remain intact, but the working class would share in a larger portion of social wealth, particularly in securing a piece of land and a home of their own. This social contract worked as long as the working class kept its head down when it came to questions of foreign policy, war, imperialism, or the workings of U.S. empire. The underlying truth to the prosperity of the U.S. working class is that it was largely built through the exploitation of colonial labor across the world, which it constantly harassed through its military. The socialist revolutions in Vietnam in 1945, Korea in the same year, China in 1949, or Cuba in 1959, represented efforts for the colonized nations of the world to assert their self-determination on the global stage. Each of these socialist revolutions posed threats to Western dominance by resisting imperialist exploitation, which is why the U.S. made such violent efforts to crush them throughout the Cold War. Even the U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower made a dire warning to the American people regarding the nation's growing dependency on the military as a branch of industry. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporation, corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development. Yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, the brakes were effectively applied to unrestrained laissez-faire capitalism. But as reflected in Eisenhower's warning, the power of capital was still alive and well. FDR kept the capitalist system alive, and in doing so, maintained the class contradictions that led to economic crises. Maintaining class control over the means of production 
also meant that real social power, economic power, continued to reside under the control of the capitalist class. So long as the means of production remained in the hands of the bourgeoisie, it would use its economic power to influence economic development and state policies, whether in the form of war, lower wages, corporate tax cuts, curtailing worker rights, or reducing social spending. The New Deal did not replace the capitalist class as the producers of commodities, and therefore it remained free to control the price of goods. The state could make all efforts to promote higher wages, stronger unions, and greater social reforms, but if it simultaneously permitted capitalists to simply raise prices whenever workers received more income, then the state reforms were only temporary. The workers would gain wealth, and all the prices would rise. They would strike for higher wages, gain wealth, then prices would rise once more. Workers would go on strike again, gain higher wages, and so on and so on. This process finally reached the peak of absurdity in the 1970s after spiraling inflation led to a sharp rise in prices and wages. In 1970, Richard Nixon finally implemented the Economic Stabilization Act through executive order, giving him the power to implement a 90-day price freeze on goods and wages to control price inflation. We must protect the position of the American dollar as a pillar of monetary stability around the world. In the past seven years, there's been an average of one international monetary crisis every year. Now, who gains from these crises? Not the working man, not the investor, not the real producers of wealth. The gainers are the international money speculators. Because they thrive on crises, they help to create them. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. This period of rapid price inflation unfolded within a broader crisis of U.S. hegemony at the international level. The Bretton Woods monetary system gave the U.S. dollar supremacy by pinning it to the price of gold. This meant that as new goods entered the market, new gold needed to enter the market to maintain stable prices. In essence, there needed to be a delicate balance between the magnitude of commodities in the market, the amount of currency in the market, and the amount of gold in the market. This system worked as long as this delicate balance between these three commodities could remain stable. However, it wasn't long before it became clear that gold production would simply not keep pace with the production of goods in other industries. The U.S. was therefore forced to continually debase its currency from the gold standard, which translated into devaluing the currency in relation to the price of gold. This sent the U.S. ruling class into a crisis. Without the U.S. dollar backed by gold, it was hardly any better than any other national currency used in world trade. As the Bretton Woods system collapsed, the U.S. found a new commodity to pin its dollar to, petroleum. In 1973, Saudi Arabia signed an agreement to sell its petroleum on the world market in US dollars. This meant that anyone purchasing oil from Saudi Arabia would need to borrow US petrodollars before making the transaction. Saudi Arabia was granted virtual immunity from US criticism and a secure seat at the table of global power. Meanwhile, the petrodollar allowed the US to maintain its global hegemony by keeping its currency pinned to a universally desirable commodity. The crisis also gave renewed opportunity for laissez-faire economists to present their economic theories as a guide towards renewed economic prosperity. The 1930s classical theory of the Austrian school re-emerged with a new face in the 1970s as neoclassical theory out of the Chicago school. There were many thinkers of the neoclassical school that influenced public perception and government policies related to the economy. But the poster boy of neoclassical economics and neoliberalism was Milton Friedman. The real fundamental principle is that people individually should be free to decide how much they're willing to pay for uh, reducing the chances of their death. Now, people mostly aren't willing to pay very much. 
Milton Friedman was an economics professor at the University of Chicago who developed a renewed vision of Austrian economic theory under the banner of freedom. He taught his students that capitalism equated to freedom at every level of society, economics, and politics. A group of his students, known as the Chicago Boys, came from Latin America to study economics at the Chicago School. After their studies, they returned home and were given the opportunity to materialize their neoclassical economic theories with the overthrow and murder of the socialist Chilean president Salvador Allende in 1973. The far-right military dictatorship that replaced the socialist Allende staffed many of the Chicago boys in key positions of policy development. They introduced sweeping reforms that dismantled many of the progressive programs and agencies introduced under Allende that were not dissimilar to those of FDR's New Deal. Along with the assault on Chilean institutions was an outright attack on tens of thousands of socialists and communists who were tortured and murdered for resisting the rise of Pinochet's founding brand of neoliberalism. By the 1980s, the ruling class in the US and England decided that they liked what they saw in Chile and proceeded to introduce similar brands of neoliberalism in their own countries, which came to dominate much of Western Europe and Canada shortly after. It was, once again, a drastic shift in the social contract between the state and working class, only this time it was not based on a New Deal, but naked exploitation of the working class. Neoliberalism marked the definitive end to the era of Keynes's demand-side economic theories and inaugurated a sharp return to laissez-faire capitalism. In general, it ushered in a decline in corporate taxes, privatization of public assets, deregulation of industry and finance, curtailment of labor power, reduction in social spending, and an overall rise of unfettered private property. The neoliberal worldview views capitalism as a market system guided by voluntary exchanges between buyers and sellers. Market equilibrium between supply and demand is achieved when this process is allowed to occur unimpeded. State intervention, whether in the form of taxes, public ownership, industrial regulations or social reforms, is seen as antagonistic to market forces and therefore ought to be minimized. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant, to get government back within its means, and to lighten our punitive tax burden. And these will be our first priorities, and on these principles there will be no compromise. In Chile, the neoliberal experiment was initiated with the privatization of the state-managed pension program. The pension system was intended to secure a fund for old age retirement for working class Chileans. It was one of the many progressive reforms introduced under Allende, but the Chicago boys turned the pensions into a massive Wall Street gambling fund and handed it over to financial speculators. In the US, nothing demonstrated neoliberalism's departure from the New Deal era more clearly than the Reagan administration's handling of the air traffic control worker strike in 1981. Unlike FDR, who lent legal and moral support to the struggle of trade unions against capital, Reagan's approach to striking workers was much more favorable to employers. In 1981, when the Professional Air Traffic Control Operators Union decided to launch a strike, 13,000 workers walked off the job to demand a shorter work week, more pay, and greater negotiating power for the union. The Reagan administration fired almost all the striking workers and had them immediately replaced by military air traffic controllers. The neoclassical economist Alan Greenspan, reflecting on the legacy of Ronald Reagan, noted that perhaps the most important and then highly controversial domestic initiative was the firing of air traffic controllers in August 1981. The president invoked the law that striking government employees forfeit their jobs, an action that unsettled those who cynically believed no president would ever uphold that law. President Reagan prevailed, but far more importantly, his action gave weight to the legal right of private employers, previously not fully exercised, to use their own discretion to both hire and discharge workers. This state-sponsored strike-breaking was a major signal to capitalists and other industries, it sent the message that they no longer had to be tolerant when their workers formed into a rabble. They could simply be terminated and replaced by scabs. <laughs>
Neoliberalism developed within the context of two major changes at the global level. The first was globalization. Until the 1980s, globalization referred to the export of commodities or capital in the form of foreign investment. But with the invention of the jet engine and global telecommunications technologies, it became possible to export entire means of production abroad. The underdeveloped world started becoming the epicenter of manufacturing as Western capital began setting up shop in countries like China. In the U.S., well-paying jobs in manufacturing, such as the auto sector, started becoming squeezed out by foreign competitors, such as those in Japan, and needed to reduce labor costs by moving production abroad. This led to widespread deindustrialization in the West, but widespread industrialization in places like China. The second major global transformation was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. After the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, neoliberalism implemented the shock doctrine that it used in Chile to privatize Soviet state assets. Infrastructure and other public assets that took decades of labor, funding, wars, and working class sacrifice to build were all robbed by capitalist vultures who swooped in to gobble them up at discount prices. In the early 90s, it appeared as though neoliberal capitalism had triumphed. Soviet communism was gone, and China was opening up to the world market, slowly integrating itself into the global capitalist system. Many within the bourgeois class were celebrating and touting the triumph of capitalism in ushering in the end of history. The fall of Soviet communism and the consolidation of China into the global capitalist system represented the overcoming of major barriers to capitalist expansion. Soviet communism was no longer a viable alternative, and Chinese communism would surely endure the same fate within the global capitalist system of trade and finance. But this triumph only resolved the crisis for the bourgeois class. Cheap labor in China and the opening of markets across the former Soviet states did nothing to improve the lives of working class people at home. The working class was generally apathetic towards capitalism. This remained true throughout the 1990s as well as the early 2000s, but after the 2008 economic collapse, many people woke up to the violence of the capitalist system as their homes, their jobs, or their life savings were ripped away from them at the drop of a dime. In wake of the 2008 crisis, 10 million Americans lost their jobs, 3 million Americans lost their homes, and millions of people lost their life savings as $450 billion was wiped out from pension funds. Meanwhile, the banks, whose risky but very lucrative financial speculation fueled the crisis, were bailed out with taxpayer money to the tune of roughly $750 billion, while the executives of these financial industries walked away from the crisis while paying themselves record bonuses, up to $90 million. Once again, the distinction between the New Deal and the neoliberal approach to economic crises came to the forefront. In 1933, the Great Depression was resolved with a massive redistribution of wealth to the American working class. But the Great Recession of 2008 was resolved with a massive redistribution of wealth to the financial system. With the hundreds of billions of dollars in bailouts and the trillions of dollars of monetary stimulus, nearly all of it went almost directly into the hands of the capitalist class. In the 1930s, the Great Depression led many workers into socialist and communist parties who sought to follow the lead of the Soviet Union in waging a revolutionary struggle against capital. But in 2008, no such alternative existed. The capitalist class did not need to make any concessions to the workforce, nor did it even need to deter foreign nations away from a communist alternative. When it came to economic downturns and crises, everyone would simply have to bite the bullet as capital was bailed out. The period leading up to the current crisis, featuring price inflation, wage stagnation, rampant economic inequality, and ecological destruction, there have been tentative proposals for a renewal of Keynesian economic policies. Some have argued for a Green New Deal, which would introduce large infrastructure projects in the energy sector to place the U.S. as a global leader in so-called sustainable development. Others argue that the nature of the global economic system requires a type of global neo-Keynesianism to introduce an international redistribution of wealth. 
While it may be fair to draw certain parallels between the crisis of the 1920s and the crisis of the 2020s, history teaches us that it is necessary to move beyond the capitalist system in order to seriously confront the global challenges that lay ahead. As the New Deal was being unrolled in the 1930s, socialists and communists warned U.S. workers that if capitalists had the power to give workers these reforms, they also had the power to take them away. Keynesianism with a global humanitarian face, or greenwashed Keynesianism, is still an economic system in the hands of the bourgeois class. We should also keep in mind that the so-called golden age of capitalism, while beneficial to many workers, was also the basis of redlining black communities, growing the military-industrial complex, colonizing the third world, enforcing strict gender roles in the family, and continuing the perpetual robbery of indigenous land. It should also be noted that each of these crises was resolved at the global level through monetary reforms that maintained U.S. unipolar hegemony. After the fall of Soviet communism, the U.S. ruling class believed that global capitalism had truly presented the world with no alternative, and for several decades this certainly seemed to be true. In 1990, China's GDP sat at around 360 billion, poverty was still widespread, industry was underdeveloped, and the country's voice held little sway in geopolitics. By 2000, Chinese GDP had tripled to 1.2 billion. Fueled by over a billion people seeking to avoid another century of humiliation, China easily became the fastest growing economy in the world, with an average annual growth rate of approximately 9%. By the onset of the 2008 economic crisis, China's GDP was at $4.5 trillion, and it was no longer stuck in a position where it was forced to endure the global economic chaos caused by unfettered neoliberal capitalism and the US petrodollar. The crisis was a wake-up call for China, and it decided to start asserting itself on the world stage. By 2021, China's GDP stood at $17.7 trillion, and it has quickly emerged as one of the most important economic powers in the contemporary political milieu. Well, the world's 10 wealthiest men doubled their fortunes during the first two years of the pandemic as poverty and inequality soared. That is the claim of the British aid charity Oxfam. It is calling on governments to tax the gains made by billionaires whose wealth increased by an average rate of $1.3 billion a day. In wake of the COVID-19 crisis and the war in Ukraine, China has been on the forefront of producing the initiatives and infrastructure that are necessary for a more equitable and sustainable global development, as seen in the Belt and Road Initiative. But more importantly, as US imperialism threatens to plunge Europe into World War III, China has proven to be a global leader in peace. In March 2023, China brokered a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia and has demonstrated global leadership in brokering a peace deal between Ukraine and Russia. But perhaps the most significant initiative spearheaded by China and its global partners is in the introduction of an alternative global currency to the US petrodollar. In 2023, the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, introduced a plan to implement trade of petroleum in currencies that circumvent the US dollar. If this plan moves forward, it will spell the end of the petrodollar and the end of US dollar hegemony across the world. As neoliberal capitalism continues to deepen its contradictions, US imperialism resorts to violent means to resolve the underlying perpetual economic crises. Bombing the hell out of the Middle East, occupying Afghanistan for 20 years, overthrowing foreign governments, stoking Taiwanese nationalism, or provoking and escalating the war in Ukraine, all these unnecessary and undesirable provocations and conflicts are squeezing the working class to keep neoliberalism alive. China is fighting to undermine this neoliberal system of capital at the global level, and if socialists, trade unionists, academics, or any brand of Marxist is serious about fighting for a world beyond neoliberal capitalism, we should be identifying with China as our ally in this struggle and work to organize and fight against capitalism at the ground level here at home. Capitalism will not wither away on its own, but needs to be pushed through organizing a party that will be ready to seize capitalist crises and direct the masses towards a world defined by peace and cooperation between nations.